Good morning. Where'd y'all come from? <laughs> Good night. We're glad you're here. College students must be back. Let me uh, just for a uh, to the college students here. Oh, y'all waving at me? No. <laughs> the uh, if you're not wanting to come to uh, the college class net. We need 300 of you to come to the 915 service. Can you do that? Only 300. Yeah. I think y'all can do it. I've got faith in you because you're already at Harding, so I know you can count to four or five. So anyway, they're still coming in the door back there, and I'm killing time and. Brent wants to say something. Good morning. It's good to see all you guys. I told Rachel and Debbie, I said this church thing's really catching on, so that's uh, good. They thought it was funny. Y'all don't think it's funny. They thought it was funny. Um, so my name is Brent Wilson. Uh, I'm in charge of college ministry here at Highway. Um, just wanted to say a quick thank you. If I met you in the student center, it is awesome to meet you last week in the student center as the freshmen rolled through. Uh, also want to say a big thanks to uh, Heather Kemper and Jamie for getting all the supplies and everything we needed for that done. Um, and also all those that volunteered their time to, uh, to help during that uh, time frame. So really appreciate all that help. Uh, I want to announce a uh, class for students is going to start in the OR, which is the building across the parking lot. It's the one with the tan siding. If you're from here, you'll get that joke. If you're not, you'll catch it when you leave. But it's uh, the building across the street, or across the parking lot here. Uh, 9.30 next week, we're starting. Um, every semester, we normally have a uh, male and female intern. Uh, and so I think we have a, a guy lined out for this semester, but we're still looking for uh, a girl to help with uh, class and get everything going over there. I didn't let any of the other services know, so y'all are kind of the ones that get the deal. This is a paid gig, so you get paid every week, so this is kind of a good thing. So uh, if you're a female want to help out with college ministry, uh, it's a good opportunity. Um, also, if any of you guys uh, would like to help teach, and that's only like one Sunday or two Sundays, we have about four guys lined up now. Uh, trying to get different perspectives and, and different folks over there for you to teach. So if any of you be interested in teaching, just let me know. My information is in the bulletin. It's Brent Wilson. My phone number's there. Also, uh, there are some flyers at each entrance uh, that tell about our college class and it's starting next week. So hope you all guys have a great semester. Thanks. So during the school year uh, for the kind of the well, we got a small group ministry, and if you are a leader, um, you see yourself as a leader who can, who can get a group together, um, meet tonight at 5 o'clock in the old auditorium. If you're a co-leader, join us. If you're not quite ready to lead a small group, you don't feel like, and, uh, but, you're, but you're willing to fill in, come. Or if you're a host, if you have a home and you're willing to open up your home to have a small group, uh, in your home on Sunday nights. We're going to try to kind of uh, let leaders, co-leaders, and hosts meet each other and form some new groups. We've just got a lot of people that we need to assimilate, and we don't get to know each other in these large settings like we do when we uh, come into people's homes. So talking to kind of the uh, 22 and up crowd as far as the leaders, co-leaders, and um, hosts for these small groups that we're having on Sunday nights. Also, I want to echo what, what Bob said. We've got a pretty full crowd at our 8 o'clock service. It's kind of like modest, safe crowd. 9 o'clock is just a handful of people. Our 9.15, excuse me, our 9.15 assembly, there's just kind of a smattering of people. And we need like a big chunk of y'all to come to the 9.15 assembly if you're, if you're not likely to go to Bible class. The Bible classes happen at 9.15. Uh, around that time as well. So, but if you imagine, I'm probably not going to go and traditionally have not gone to Bible class. Please come to the 915 assembly and fill that one up, and then we'll have three 
evenly distributed assemblies. Okay. We're not full yet. We have had them sitting up here on the stage. I think the whole auditorium is already full over there. So uh, we're glad you're here, college students. If we can help you this year, we want to. So uh, we can't guess what you need, though. Get a hold of one of us, and we'll be more than glad to help you with anything we can. Again, 915. Can y'all put that in your... Well, I ain't got mine. Put it in your phone where that dinger will go off. We need you here at 915. 300 of you. And that'll pretty well even us out, maybe, on the thing. Anybody got anything we need? Again, thank you, college students. Let's all stand. Jesus loves me, this I know. sky but my one request lord my only aim is that you reign in me again lord reign in me reign in your power over all my dreams in my darkest eye you are the lord of all i am so won't you reign in me again over Every thought over every word May my life reflect the beauty of my Lord Cause you mean more to me than any earthly thing So won't you reign in me again Lord reign in me Reign in your power over all my dreams In my darkest hour you are the Lord of all I am So won't you reign in me again Lord reign in me Reign in your power over all my dreams In my darkest hour you are the Lord of all I am So won't you reign in me again and the church said, we don't have our prayer. Father, we thank you for being our God and for gathering us here and for protecting us, for calling us your own, for loving us when we're not lovable, for forgiving us when we have done wrong, Father, thank you for the hope that we feel. Thank you for the faith that you have in us. You see the best version of us, and we thank you so much for that. Father, our thoughts go to this semester. For many of us, we live semester by semester. And Father, I pray that as we start off this new semester, this new school year, that our hearts will be filled with hope, that we can keep our eyes on you, that you will protect us, you will strengthen us. You will help us to be more positive, more optimistic, more loving, less selfish. Father, thank you so much for all of these that are here. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for loving us through him, for showing how you really feel about us. Help us to aspire to that level of love. Thank you for the elders here and for their guidance. Father, please be with us. It's in Christ we pray. Amen.
Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. May be seated. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man. You were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known, above all wealth, and treasures of the earth there's no way to measure what your work crucified laid behind the stone you live to die neglected and alone like the rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above all crucified laid behind the stone you live to die rejected and alone like the rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above all like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall and thought of me above all First Corinthians 11, it says this, The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in, remem in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. 
This is a new covenant that we are a part of as new creations in Jesus Christ. And Hebrews tells us it's a better covenant based on better promises. It's eternal life for sure, but it's also an abundant life in the here and now is the best of what Jesus desires for us. And so just a thought to think about as we take the bread, the living bread of Jesus Christ, total satisfaction is found in Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And total satisfaction in Jesus Christ is what truly disarms the enemy's lies. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you loved us so much. You gave us Jesus. And then Jesus, you literally gave it all. When you knew your hour had come and you washed your disciples' feet and you knew it was coming, that you did it willingly and you did it out of, did it out of complete love for us and unconditional love. And I just pray that all of us, whatever it is that we're going for and, and seeking in life, that we recognize, Jesus, you really are the way, the truth, the life, and total satisfaction comes in you. And that with you, we'll never go hungry. It's in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. You know, when we talk about this new covenant and we think about the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for us, you know, there's forgiveness of sins, obviously, when we come to Christ. But there's also the gift of the Holy Spirit. And his blood was shed so his spirit could live inside of you and me. And that's what will truly, truly transform us. Let me read something really quick from 2 Corinthians 3, starting in verse 16. Whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. He doesn't just want you to be saved. He wants you to be transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory through the power of the Holy Spirit that is living inside of you as a new creation. So whatever struggle, temptation you're facing this week, what about the role of the Holy Spirit? What about the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Well, God just made that person that way. What about the role of the Holy Spirit? Well, I've just been made this way. This is just who I am. What about the Spirit of Jesus Christ living inside of you that can truly transform you with ever increasing glory into the image and likeness of Jesus Christ? Let's pray. God, help us to remember that this really is, is supernatural. We can't become what we need to become by ourselves. Human effort alone just won't do it. I, I pray that we remember, as we remember the bread, as we remember the fruit of the vine, the blood that was shed so your spirit could live inside of us, that we recognize this is an incomparably great power for us who believe. And the same spirit that raised you from the dead, Jesus Christ, you died so that could live inside of us and transform us into your image with ever increasing glory. And I pray that for everybody here and especially for these college students. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. It's a lot of people to serve communion to. It's a good thing. This is a good time to remember who the source is the source of every good thing in our life, including financially, it really is the Lord's. And it's a great opportunity to exercise your trust and giving back to him, whether you think you have enough or not, just step out and give, see what the Lord does, see how he gets back to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you truly are the source of every good thing in our life. And the more we recognize that it's yours and that you don't require, just require, but you really desire us to, to give abundantly and cheerfully and uh, to recognize that it's not ours to give away and that we need to pay it forward. And so I thank you for this church. This is a very giving church in every which way, including financially, and they really do it sacrificially. And I thank you for these young people and just continue to, um, continue to, to grow a spirit of generosity in all of us, but including the, the young college students here. We're so thankful that they're here. And uh, I pray that they also feel within their heart to give what they can give. I love you, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for giving everything that you have for us and doing it with a spirit of love and generosity. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.
You are Lord of creation and Lord of my life, Lord of the land and the sea. You were Lord of the heavens before there was time, and Lord of all lords you will be. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. We bow down and we worship you, Lord. Lord of all lords you will be you are king of creation and king of my life king of the land and the sea you were king of the heavens before there was time and king of all kings you will be we bow down and we crown you the king we bow down and we crown you the we bow down and we crown you the king king of all kings you will be Let us all together stand. At this time, we'd like to dismiss to Wigglers Worship. I mean, if you got Wigglies, little Wiggler people, it's that time as well as the nursery. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. I will praise you all my days. You're perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. I will obey your word. Kingdom come, not my will but yours be done. Glory, glory to the Lamb. You take me by the hand, lead us to that promised land. Glory, glory to the Lamb. Hail, hail, O line of Judah. How powerful you are. All right, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. This is happening one service, two service, now the third service. I just did a key change and everybody stayed down. <laughs> so, let's try that again. <laughs> hail, hail, O line of Judah, yes. How powerful you are. Hail, hail, O line of Judah. How wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. And the church say it. You may be seated. I therefore, prisoner for the Lord, urge you, walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, 
and one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Who is Jesus? That is the most important question you will ever have to answer. More important than do you take this woman to be your awfully wedded wife? First two services didn't get that either, James. <laughs> More important even than, are all these kids yours? <laughs> it's the most important question because it's the question that both defines your present and determines your future. In other words, how you live and how you die are both determined by how you answer this question. Who is Jesus? It's not an easy question to answer because there are a lot of different opinions out there and they are not all equal and they are not all valid. Not even all the answers in here among these people who claim to know Jesus best are acceptable. I want you to think for just a moment about all the different visions, or should I say versions of Jesus that are floating around out there. There's baby Jesus, cute, cuddly little baby Jesus, playing with the farm animals, inviting us to his birthday party, sending us home with gift bags. There's social activist Jesus. He's woke and he's militant. He's occupying Wall Street and turning over the tables of the money changers and the hedge fund managers that he finds there. And there's long-haired hippie Jesus. He's a cool dude that you just want to hang with. I mean, he's like totally enlightened and like not at all preachy. And he's like, don't judge, man. <laughs> And who doesn't love G.I. Jesus? A real American hero, wrapped in the flag, fighting for truth, justice, and democracy against all the commies in the cosmos. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how people created in the image of God are forever trying to create God in their image? If they believe in Jesus at all, he tends to be a very familiar figure. One who likes what they like, dislikes what they dislike. One whose beliefs and practices are totally in line with their own. But here's the deal. When it comes to Jesus, I'm not sure this kind of revisionist history will suffice. See, there's another vision or version of Jesus. One that's presented in Scripture, one that is much more accurate, and one that demands our full attention and our full allegiance. It's the one that the New Testament envisions some 700 times. It's the one that our book of Ephesians envisions at least eight times. It's the one that Paul says in Ephesians is absolutely essential to our Christian identity and our Christian unity. And that is the vision of Jesus as Lord. Lord Jesus. Who is Jesus? Jesus is Lord. And there's only one Lord. What do we mean when we say that Jesus is Lord? There are two ideas that I want you to consider, and the first is this. To confess Jesus as Lord is to express a theological conviction about Jesus. When we say Jesus is Lord, we're saying something about Jesus. The confession, Jesus is Lord, is the shortest, the simplest, and the earliest of all Christian creeds. In the first church, those people who made the confession, Jesus as Lord, were baptized into Him and were added to His church. Because Paul wrote, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. 
And to the Philippians, Paul said there's coming a day when at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. It's a significant statement. When Paul says Jesus Christ is Lord, it's a significant statement because when Paul says Jesus Christ is Lord, he's giving to Jesus a God title. Ho curios, the Lord. When the Old Testament was translated from Hebrew into Greek, about 200 years before the time of Jesus by Jewish scholars in Alexandria of Egypt, they did not know what to do with the holy name of God, that name that we've come to know as Yahweh or, or Jehovah. They weren't able to translate it. They weren't able to transliterate it. They weren't even able to pronounce it because the ancient Hebrews themselves did not pronounce the name. When the ancient Hebrews encountered that name in the text, they replaced it with another Hebrew word, Adonai, or the Lord. And so when the Greek translators came along and they encountered that holy name for God, they simply gave it the Greek alternative, Ho Curios, the Lord. Some 6,000 times in the Greek version of the Old Testament, you have Ho Curios, the Lord. And listen very carefully to me. The earliest followers of Jesus did not hesitate for a moment to give Jesus that same divine title, Ho Curios, the Lord. Some 700 times in the New Testament, Jesus is called Ho Curios, the Lord. To call Jesus the Lord is tantamount to saying Jesus is God. From the very earliest time, He was recognized as God, acclaimed as God, and worshipped as God. So to confess Jesus as Lord is to express a theological conviction about Him. Jesus is God. And to deny such is to put yourself outside the historic Christian faith. To deny such is to withdraw your fellowship from the historic Christian church. Jesus is God. Jesus is Lord. But there's more. This confession that Jesus is Lord is more than just a conviction about Jesus. The confession of Jesus is Lord, to confess that is to make a personal commitment to Jesus. This phrase, ho curios, was used in secular Greek to describe people who were owners. Owners of lands, owners of property, owners of slaves. Because they owned those things, they had the right of control over those things. They had the right to dispose of those things. Or in other words, those things were at their disposal. They could do with those things what they wished. Well, in the same way, the person who confesses that Jesus is Lord commits himself to Jesus' disposal. She commits herself to being under Jesus' control. To say that Jesus is Lord is to make a radical, personal commitment to Jesus. And that radical, personal commitment affects every area of your life. Every area of one's being comes under Jesus' control or at His disposal. And I want to pursue that idea for just a few minutes. We're looking at these things from the book of Ephesians, and I want you to notice what Ephesians says about being under Jesus' control. The first thing is this. To confess Jesus as Lord, to make a personal commitment to Him, is to make an intellectual commitment to Him. Now, Ephesians is setting the parameters, so listen to what Paul says. Chapter 4. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that's not the way you learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about Him and were taught in Him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and that is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds. 
To put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Surely you've got the emphasis in the text on the mind and the understanding and the learning and the, and the being taught. The mind is the control tower of our human personality. The mind directs the way we walk or the way we live. Yet our minds are often the last stronghold to capitulate to the Lordship of Jesus because we like to think our own thoughts. We like to form our own opinions after we've had the time to make up our own minds. And so when our own thoughts and opinions come into conflict with the teaching of Jesus, so much for Jesus. But see, Jesus claims lordship over our minds. We've not just been taught about Jesus, we've been taught by Jesus. Our Lord is a teacher and we are His disciples. Disciples of Christ are taught by Christ and they are, listen carefully, not at liberty to disagree with Him about the things concerning which He taught about God and human beings, about life and death, about duty and dignity, about salvation and judgment. There is a desperate need in our day where weird and wild speculations abound to sit at the feet of Jesus and learn from Him. Do you remember that beautiful invitation at the end of Matthew 11? The one where Jesus says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a beautiful invitation, but unfortunately, a lot of preachers stop right there. When in reality, there's another invitation given. Keep reading. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The first invitation is to come to Jesus and lay down the burden of other people's teaching and other people's expectations. The second invitation is to come take Jesus' yoke of teaching and His yoke of expectation. And He says, when you do that, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, Jesus' yoke of teaching binds us to Him, and it's easier for us. That makes sense because He's God. He created us. He knows what's best for us. He knows the way that we should be pushing. To confess that Jesus is Lord is to submit to His yoke of teaching. Which leads to the second commitment. To confess that Jesus is Lord is not just an intellectual commitment, it is a moral and ethical commitment. In this same passage in Ephesians 4, Paul talks about the difference that learning from Jesus makes in how we live. See, the conversion of the mind begets the conversion of the body. And so notice the differences. The old self, the self that's in rebellion to the Lordship of Jesus, is characterized by futility and darkness and alienation and ignorance and hardness and callousness and sensuality and corruption and deception. But the new self, the self committed to the Lordship of Jesus, is characterized by righteousness and holiness. And if you read along in the text, Paul goes on in the next several paragraphs to talk about other commitments. The commitments of righteousness and holiness that Christians make. Commitments to truth-telling. To hard work and generosity, to reconciliation, to edification, to sexual purity. And then right in the middle of it, he says, and don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Imitate God. Follow the example of Jesus and pursue what pleases the Lord. Listen. Those who confess that Jesus is Lord, those who are under His control and at His disposal, those who have been taught by Him and submit to Him are not free to pursue whatever they please. They are free to pursue what pleases the Lord. The Lordship of Jesus comes with a moral commitment to follow the ways of Jesus. The Apostle John put it this way, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 
But whoever keeps His word, in Him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in Him. Whoever abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which He walked. We live in an age of moral relativism. It's an age in which there are seemingly no absolutes. It's an age in which people determine for themselves what is right or wrong, and they call it living their truth. But a commitment to the Lordship of Jesus is a commitment to living His truth. And nowhere is this as obvious as in the realm of sexual ethics, which Paul addresses in Ephesians 5. It used to be universally accepted that marriage is heterosexual, lifelong monogamy. And the only context God given for sexual intimacy and sexual union. But there are some in our world, even in the church, who accept cohabitation, which is sex without commitment, and where same sex marriage is legitimized. Marriage itself is even being redefined by the state. But listen very carefully to me the state has no right to do such a thing because marriage is ordained by God and only marriage can be defined by God. We have to have the courage to stand up for what is plainly affirmed in the teaching of our Lord Jesus about men, about women, about sex, about gender. Keep reading in Ephesians. Wives, submit to your husbands. Husbands, sacrifice for your wives. Children, obey your parents. And parents, bring your children up in the teaching and the instruction of the Lord. And all of this out of reverence for the Lord. It's often argued that Jesus never said anything about marriage or sex or gender. You haven't been listening to His teaching. Jesus said, have you not read that He who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And he said, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh so they are no longer two but one flesh and what therefore God has joined together let no man separate. See, the fundamental question before the church today is who is the Lord? Who's in control? Who is the boss? Is the church the Lord of Jesus? so that the church can edit His teaching and apply them to their situation as they see fit? Or is Jesus the Lord of the church? where what he believes and what he says to practice is what actually goes. Who's the Lord? Jesus says to us down through the centuries, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. This Lordship of Jesus demands our intellectual commitment. It demands our moral commitment. And in the question about control, it demands our political commitment. To confess Jesus as Lord is to make a political commitment to Jesus. The question of ultimate authority is answered unequivocally in Ephesians 1. Where Paul says that God raised Jesus from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And far above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. And He put all things under His feet and gave Him head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. My students accuse me of all the time of being political. But the reality is that the Lordship of Jesus is an unmistakably political claim. Jesus was condemned for both religious and political offenses. In the Jewish court, He was condemned as a blasphemer because He called Himself the Son of God, but He was no son like they expected. And in the Roman court, He was condemned for sedition because He called Himself a king, but Rome knew no king but Caesar. You see, the claims of Jesus had political implications for Him and for the early Christians. Leaders of the state have also always suffered from a little bit of megalomania. They've always believed themselves to be far more important than they actually are. Roman emperors called themselves Dominus et Deus Noster, or Lord and God. They built temples to themselves, demanded allegiance to themselves, and demanded to be lauded as Curios Caesar, or Caesar is Lord. 
But the early Christians went to torture and death rather than compromise their confession that Jesus is Lord. And the same is true for disciples today. Surely you've seen what's going on in Afghanistan. Where the Taliban has a list of Christians and they're going phone by phone looking for Bible apps. The deification of the state did not end with the Roman Empire. Still today, there are totalitarian regimes on both the left and the right that demand allegiance which no Christian can ever give them. And Christians today still go to torture or death. Others just simply disappear or are canceled. I understand that Christians are called to respect and submission. Romans 13 is in my Bible too. But we will not worship the state. We will not put all of our hopes, or any of our hopes, in the state. We will not give our uncritical allegiance to the state which the state demands. Under some circumstances, civil disobedience is required. It is a biblical doctrine, and there are notable examples of it in the Scriptures. We are to submit to the state right up to the point where what the state demands us to do comes in conflict with our submission to Jesus. And if the state abuses its God-given authority by allowing things which the Lord forbids or forbidding things which the Lord accepts, then our yes to the state becomes a no because we have said yes to Jesus. Jesus is Lord. He is not some mere politician. He is not Jesus the Great. Jesus is Lord. Fourth, to confess Jesus as Lord is to make a vocational commitment to Jesus. Committing to Jesus commits us to a lifetime of ministry. Now, I'm not saying that everybody is called to pastoral ministry. But I'm saying that the Lord's body is called to be the Lord's hands and feet at the Lord's disposal. You see what Paul says in Ephesians 4? But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. That is, in no scant measure. Then down in verse 11, And He gave apostles and prophets and evangelists and shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the works of ministry. To build up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature personhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way to Him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Every Christian is called to ministry. The followers of Jesus comprise His body. He is the head. We are His hands and feet. We are completely under His control and at His disposal. We work together in unity to accomplish His mission in the world. I want you to listen carefully to me. Most of you in this room have come to Harding to pursue your career. You've come to pursue your vocation. But listen, if you've committed yourself to the Lordship of Jesus, you cannot simply make your decisions based on what you think will earn you the most money. Money is just another gift given by the Lord Jesus to help us accomplish His mission in the world. When you start thinking about your major, when you start thinking about your career, think about that which will give you a platform for global missional ministry. Commit even your vocation to the Lordship of Jesus. And that brings me to the last thing. Commit to Jesus' global missional work. The Lord has one mission. The one Lord has one mission, and it is stated plainly in the book of Ephesians to unite all things in Christ, in heaven, and on earth. And it's not a question of if this will happen. It's a question of when will it happen. Paul says every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And some will make that commitment now. 
Some will make that commitment now and they will do it joyfully and willingly and it will direct the course of their lives and it will direct their eternity. Others will make that commitment at the judgment. And it'll be too late. And their eternity will be directed as well. Those of us who understand who the Lord is and what He is doing, those of us who are called into the global mission of the King, know that we must be about bringing back His sons and daughters, rescuing them from this dominion of darkness and death and bringing them under His dominion of light and life. Who is Jesus? Jesus is Lord. And there is only one Lord. That was significant. For the Ephesians, it meant that Artemis was not Lord. And it's significant for us because it means Washington is not his throne. And it's significant to every human being because it means if Jesus is Lord, we are not Lords. Jesus calls us this morning to identify with his Lordship and to unify with His Lordship, to do it intellectually, bring our minds under His teaching and His authority, do it morally, accept His standards and obey His commands, do it politically, refuse to idolize any human institution or politician, do it vocationally, spend your life in His liberating service and do it missionally, join Him in His mission of reclaiming the world for its rightful owner the one who is the Lord. Who is the Lord? Jesus is Lord. But that's really not the question. The question this morning is, who are you? Who are you? Are you a disciple of the Lord? Have you made that good confession that Jesus is Lord and been baptized, dying to yourself so that you can live for Him? If you have, have you committed your all, your mind, your body, your affections, your vocation to His complete control? Are you at His disposal? If the answer to either of those questions is no, won't you come while we stand and sing? Jesus is Lord, my Redeemer. How He loves me, how I love Him. He is risen, He is coming. Lord, come quickly, Alleluia. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord come quickly, Wow, what a sea of people. It's amazing to be up here and see, see everybody here, and that doesn't include the ones that are in the other auditorium. While everybody's here, I would like you to meet our eldership. Just, you know, it's the best time to know who we are, so if you've got any issues, you need something done, 
So I won't ask him to come forward, but so got Freddie and Danny in the back, the back corner there waving their arms. See Mike, you here? Mike Challenberg, nope. Bobby, he was the one that started the service off in the green shirt, which I see his spot's empty, so he's running around here somewhere. Shannon's up on the stairwell in the back. And Jerry Neal, is Jerry here? And Scott did the announcements this morning with uh, being a, a, a small group leader. So Scott's still here, anyway. And myself, I'm Dana, by the way. So anyway, that's who we are. And Harding, or Harding, Highway does several great things. I work there, so by the way. Uh, they, uh, you know, Highway, we do a Christmas packing thing once a year for smiles. And that's a great opportunity. And this is, is too. And I love to do this. So if you're visiting with us, would you please stand up? First time here. Everybody, come on. Just to know. Thank you all for coming. So Devin's our preacher. He did a great job this morning. Thank you, Devin. Got a couple of prayer requests. Uh, this morning, second service, we had a medical emergency with the family. It's William and Stacy Morgan. Now, I don't know how they're doing. And I don't know if we have any news yet on them. And then Lydia Hall, one of our members, her brother John is doing better. He's still in the hospital. I believe it's with COVID. And Will Walker's grandmother uh, fell here just the other day and is at home doing better. Great. And then for those that might have been at our granddaughter's wedding yesterday here at the building, thank you for coming and thank you for helping participate in that. And it was a great, great time for all. We have two families that have lost family members here recently, the Isom and the Thompson family, as they mourn their loss. They had the memorial services yesterday, I believe. We've got two new families that wanted to rec be recognized with our church today. I'm not sure if they're here, maybe. Um, the Grimes family. Okay, would you please stand? So that's Lucas, Jennifer, and their children, Shelby, Tristan, Landon, and Ethan Grimes. It's nice to have you with us. And the Glover family this morning, it's Will, Becky, Hallie Ann, and Bo. So that's some other new, new family members. And now we have to have an exit strategy. It took, it took 30 minutes to get in here. We can't leave in the same time. So if you're in a chair, when we stand or when we get ready to leave, would you stack your chairs the best you can along your aisle and let the people in the chairs leave first because all the exits in the back are pretty well closed off. So we'll let them leave first. So just stand where you are. Same with the groups over here in the chairs and up here in the front. And then the ones in the pews we can let. So just visit with your neighbors for a minute. So let's bow, please, as we're dismissed. Mighty Father, it's been a great day to be here. We thank you so much for the opportunity to serve those here at, at Highway. Father, we thank you for the, the new visitors that, that came. And Father, for those that return, we're glad that they're back. Father, give this, continue to give this congregation the the resources we need to do what we do here with with those and with all the other missions we have with our Nicaragua missions and our local community efforts. Father, so thankful for the leadership here, those that have dedicated their lives to serving you. Father, we thank you for the teachers and those um, deacons that serve all the education sides of things and the physical needs here at Highway. Father, we ask so overall father you give us the strength to stand up for you and as devin talked about this morning to give us give give the lord give jesus our all everything that we have is yours father use us and father help us to be those hands and feet that you mentioned that we can serve in any capacity anywhere at any time and father it's just amazing having a church family that's worldwide that it'd be so awesome to see everybody in one place but father we just it's grateful to know that we have people all over the world, even in, in Afghanistan right now, Father. Father, we thank you for all that you give us and all that you do. And we ask this bless bless blessing this morning in your name. 
Amen.